Thank you. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be with you here this afternoon in Kennaway. Uh, thank you very much for the, for the warm welcome. I'd like to kind of start by reading kind of from the kind of Gospel of Matthew, please. If you have your Bibles, you're, you're welcome to follow. If not, uh, then just uh, listen to the Word of God. Uh, so Matthew chapter 9 and just the first seven verses. Gospel of Matthew chapter 9, and we're going to read the first seven verses. It's talking about the Lord Jesus here, and it says this. So he got into a boat, crossed over, and came to his own city. Then behold, they brought to him a paralytic, lying on a bed. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, be of good cheer, your sins are forgiven you. And at once some of the scribes said within themselves, This man blasphemes. But Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, why do you think evil in your hearts? For which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven you, or to say, arise and walk? But that you may know the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. Then he said to the paralytic, arise, take up your bed and go to your house. Then he arose and departed to his house. So, I started working for a medical imaging company a few years ago, and prior to that, I'd always loved that story. But recently, I've had a renewed interest in that story, because what they've done here is they have brought really an impossible medical case to the Lord Jesus. And even in this day and age, sadly, for those who are paralyzed, it's, it's not something that you can really treat. But here they bring a case to the Lord Jesus, a, a, a paralytic. A man who's unable to walk. Now, I'm just going to reference back to another interesting medical case. And that's the concerning the, the assassination of James Garfield, who was the 20th president of the United States. Now, sadly, it seems to be a quite dangerous occupation uh, to be a president of the United States. There have been four assassinations. I think um, I, before, before listening to the story, I could have told you of two, John F. Kennedy, and Abraham Lincoln. And there's a, a, a fourth, which I don't know the name, but James Garfield was sadly assassinated on July the 2nd, 1881. Now the year is really important. He didn't die immediately though. It took 79 days for this poor man uh, to die. And a major complication of his assassination was a missing bullet. They know he had been shot and he'd been shot on the right-hand side. And the assassin was uh, disgruntled, uh, originally a, a supporter, a political supporter, who thought that he was very important and thought he'd help get James Garfield elected. He'd written a speech and, well, no one had actually, no one had actually kind of spoken the speech, but they'd read it and um, it wasn't very well uh, received, but he thought it was really important and he thought that he should have been given a job. And he thought he should have been given the job as ambassador to Vienna, but he'd be quite happy to accept uh, the ambassador to Paris instead. But he didn't get the, either of those jobs. And he was very upset about this. And so he shot James Garfield. And he shot him a few times, and there was a missing bullet. And they knew he'd been shot on the right-hand side. And so they, they tried to find the bullet. And so they, they, they dug around the wound with unsterilized fingers, dirty fingers. And they were unable to find the bullet. Alexander Graham Bell, a good Scotsman, he, uh, he's the man who invented the telephone. And he also invented, uh, for this occasion, a metal detector in the hope that he would be able to find the bullet. But unfortunately, he wasn't able to find the bullet. It didn't help the fact that the president was lying on a metal bed, which made it harder to detect anything, and they only allowed him to look on the right-hand side. Apparently, there, there were quite a few doctors, and there, there were some who were self-appointed to be, uh, be in charge, and they, there was also quite a de debate here going on here. It's quite an important thing, to be in charge of the, the president. Now, most historians and medical experts believe that he could have survived if they had been able to find and remove the bullet, hopefully using clean hands. But... How could they see inside him? The bullet was somewhere inside him, and, and they could not see inside him to see where the bullet was. 
and they could not see where the bullet was for sadly for Andrew Garfield. But just 16 years later, story could have been really, really different. For 16 years later, in 1896, they discovered x-rays. And a simple x-ray would have really clearly shown where the bullet was. And it would have shown up as a bright spot on the left-hand side. Where you see the bullet had gone in the right, but it traveled through him, maybe bounced off some bones, and it ended up on the left-hand side. And an x-ray would have shown the, the surgeon where exactly where the bullet was, and they could have gone in, and they could have extracted that bullet, and he might have survived. Now, these days, seeing inside the body it is quite commonplace. CT scans give us amazing images of your lungs or a brain. An MRI, for, depending on, on the purpose, can also give quite amazing images of, of brains and soft tissues. And for any kind of parents, grandparents, or kind of big sisters little, uh, or big brothers, I'm sure you've seen these amazing ultrasound pictures of the kind of the baby while it's still within the mother's womb. Doctors can literally see inside us. But I want to tell you this afternoon that God can see inside us. God can see inside us. The Bible tells us he knows the very hairs on our head, but more than this, he can see inside us. I wonder how that makes you feel, that God knows you inside out, and, and not just your physical body, but also your thoughts, what goes through your head. How does that make you feel? It can be very comforting. When you perhaps, if ever you feel alone, that God knows what you're going through. There's a, a Psalm, Psalm 139, and it says this. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell on the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. And the psalmist there is writing about God. And it's poetry. And I, I'm not a poet. Uh, English literature is not my strong point. So this expression here, though, it is beautiful. If I take the wings of the morning, I, I don't know how you interpret that. Maybe it's talking about the birds in the morning and the dawn flying and going high and far away. Maybe it's talking about the dawn, the dawn itself as it creeps across the globe, creeps the long word, sorry, travels actually quite quickly, a thousand miles per hour, across the surface of the earth, going off to far places. Or maybe you would prefer a more modern interpretation, the speed of light, going even faster than that, at kind of 300 million meters per second. However it is, the wings of the morning, going off in far places, however far away you are from home, from family, and you feel alone, you're not alone. Even there, God is there to support you, to lead you, to hold you. And he knows what you're going through. Whatever you're suffering, whatever you, complications you have in your life, God knows and God understands and God is there to support you. He knows and he can comfort you. And that, that's a really encouraging thought. And I want you to hold on to that. Perhaps if you have a, a personal issue you're going through, God knows and God is there to comfort you. But if God knows our thoughts, I must confess that there's another side to that. And it, it can also perhaps be a, a little worrying. We also read this expression in our passage. But Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, why do you think evil in your hearts? And so here of the scribes, Jesus knows what they're thinking. And he knows it's evil. And in Jeremiah, Jeremiah says this, but you, O Lord, know me. You have seen me and you have tested my heart towards you. And so it is that if someone does something wrong openly, we can all see it. So recently, you'll find this in the BBC, a driver was recently given nine points for drifting on a roundabout, doing a stunt, a car stunt on a roundabout. But it's all on television. It's on CCTV. But you can all see 
what this kind of driver has done. But God knows what we do in private. And even more than that, he knows our thoughts. And that's, that's very sobering. It's a little scary, to be honest. A little bit challenging. That God knows what I do, perhaps, when I don't think anyone's looking. And more than that, he knows my thoughts. He knows when I've been selfish. Either in my actions or in my thoughts. He knows if we've been unkind in our thoughts, corrupt in our thoughts, perverse in our thoughts. Whatever we have thought, God knows. And God knows this. And God knows, as the Bible calls it, our sin. And the result is this, that God knows this, and there is a consequence to, consequence to sin. Isaiah 64, verse 5 says this. You meet him who rejoices and does righteousness, who remembers you in your ways. And that's good. And the Lord isn't just looking down and, and just judging our sin. He, he does recognize those who do good, those who are righteous. But it goes on to say this. You are indeed angry, for we have sinned. In these ways we continue, and we need to be saved. We need to be saved. So why do we need to be saved? Well, because when God sees inside us, when God sees inside us and he sees our selfishness, our disobedience, our, our breaking of his laws, there's a result of that. There's a consequence of that. There's judgment because of that. There's death because of that. Eternal judgment because of those things. And so Isaiah rightly says that we need to be saved. So God knows us. But more than this, I can tell you this, that God is able to do something about it. Now, let's suppose that they had been able to x-ray James Garfield, that president, that man who's lying there with a bullet in the left-hand side, and they managed to say, we've been able to detect the bullet. Here's the issue that's causing all your pain, all your suffering. Here's the issue that's going to kill you. Well, I would have said James Garfield, I, I'm very glad you found it. Can you do something about it? Can you remove it? And they hopefully would have been able to. It would have required some effort and some skill on their parts. Hopefully they would have washed their hands first of all before they did so. But they would have been able to do something about it with a reasonable amount of effort. All, all the training that they would have had to have done in, in the first place. But I can tell you this as well. Not only does God know our sin, but he's able to do something about it. If it wasn't for that, we wouldn't be in a gospel meeting. See, the gospel is the good news. And this is the good news. That Lord God, who knows us and knows our sin and knows our failures, can do something about it. You see, the Lord Jesus, when he sees this man who's, a, who's paralyzed, who even today they wouldn't be able to do much about that. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, son, be of good cheer. Your sins are forgiven you. Now, the scribes there, they ask the question, to say your sins are forgiven you. Well, it's easy to say in that it's easy for the words to leave your mouth. I can say many things. I can say to my garden, the weeds, just go away, please. But it won't make any difference. For the words to leave the mouth, for literally the, the, the word, word after word, to say something, it, it, it can be easy. But to do it, that's another issue. For the Lord Jesus to say it and actually to be able to show and demonstrate and actually do it, that is difficult. And so the Lord Jesus was able to say to the man to demonstrate his power. And, and we see this right throughout the Gospels that Jesus is going to do this over and over again. He's going to show his power because of the miracles that he's going to do. And so he, he says to this man, arise and walk. 
If this man had, had come to doctors in this day and age, I think they would have started uh, perhaps with some probing, maybe a physiotherapist, just check it's not just weak muscles. Maybe an x-ray to see if he's got a broken bone, which uh, needs to be rebroken and reset. Maybe a CT scan, maybe an MRI, maybe an ultrasound. And they would have probed and wondered what was causing the problem. But Jesus, the creator, is able to see inside this man. And I think it may, I guess paralytic, I'm assuming the spine. Whatever the issue is, nerve damage, whatever it is, he's able to see inside and the creator is able to put it right. But more than this, Jesus is also able to forgive those sins. How can he do that? How can the Lord Jesus forgive sins? What right has he got to forgive sins? Well, Peter tells us this. You see, for the Lord Jesus to be able to actually forgive that man's sins, he had to take them upon himself. Peter tells us this. I'm talking of the Lord Jesus, who himself bore our sins in his, in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. The Lord Jesus Christ had to take those sins upon himself. Sins are, are so vile and so horrific that God cannot and will not just ignore them. There needs to be a consequence to sin. There must be judgment because of sin. And that's what the Lord Jesus was doing on the cross of Calvary. When he died on the cross, and we, we, we see the external, and that's horrific, that's horrible, suffering of crucifixion. But more than this, in the hours of darkness, he was being punished by God for sin. And so, because of that, because he was taking the punishment himself, he was able to say to that man, Son, be of good cheer. Your sins are forgiven you. No light statement. No easy thing to actually do. No easy thing to say and to follow through. To say, to be able to say to that man, your sins are forgiven you. The Lord Jesus was at that point looking forward to the point when he would die on the cross of Calvary in incredible agony and be forsaken by God. And because he's done that now, now we look back. He's still able to forgive sins. But, you know, there is a really essential step. You see, that, that man came with his problem. I, I love the story in particular because that man thought his biggest problem was his paralysis. He thought his biggest problem was the fact that he couldn't walk. But the Lord Jesus recognized what really was that man's biggest problem, his sin. And he dealt with that first. And that's our biggest problem. But you know that the NHS this day has got this idea of a patient-centered care, I think they call it. And it's the idea that really the patient, their choices, their decisions, are really central to the care of the patient. I think we've got some people who work actually work in the NHS, and they can correct me later. But the point here is that there's a choice. That yeah, let's suppose uh, I've got a kind of a, a, a sore shoulder. It's up to me if I go to the doctor. No one's going to make me go to the doctor. No one's going to make me do some exercises to try and build it up. No one's going to try and make me take, take ibuprofen, whatever it is. If I choose not to, if I choose to kind of not look after my body, well, that's my choice. That's my decision. But you see here, for this man to come to Jesus, he actually had to make quite an effort. But he couldn't walk. And we read elsewhere how his friends brought him. They carried him. And he had to agree to that. And he had to be lowered through the roof. He had to make an effort to come to the Lord Jesus. And so it is with us. Jesus is willing and able to deal with our problem, or forgive our sins. But it does require a confession of our sins. We need to recognize we've got a problem. We need to admit 
that we've got fault in our life. And that's not always easy. If you think maybe individually, how willing are we to admit that we're at fault? It could be anything. Maybe uh, a car accident. And who was at fault? Who pulled out when they shouldn't have pulled out? Who was going too fast? And so on. We don't like to admit fault. But when it comes to our sin, we need to admit fault. We need to admit our sin before God. And that's why John's verse in kind of 1 John chapter 1, verse 9 starts with an if, a really important if. And it says this, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So then, the diagnosis is in. God, who's able to see inside us, he sees inside us, and yes, he, he recognizes the good that we do, but he also sees the sin inside us. God, who's seen inside us, has seen our sin, and he's offering to do something about it. Because Jesus Christ died on the cross, he's offering to forgive us our sin if we put our trust and faith in him, if we confess our sin. The choice is ours. It really is. The choice is ours. If we confess our sin, we can come to the one who's able to do something about it, who knows us inside out and is able to do something about it. And he's the only one who can do something about it, the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Lord God, we give you thanks to the Lord Jesus Christ. We give you thanks to kind of the fact that kind of he can see us, he can see inside us, he knows us physically, he knows the color of our hair, the hairs on our head, he knows our height, he knows our, our health issues, but he knows us more than this. He knows our problems, he knows us what keeps us awake at night. Lord God, how we thank thee that we can come to thee, uh, whenever concern that we have, that we can come to thee and we can just leave it with thee and give thanks that thou art there to support us. But more than this, Lord, we give thanks that thou art able as well to see inside us, you know our failures, you know our sin, you know our selfishness, our, our lies, our wickedness, our, our evil thoughts, you know all these things, you know what, what we've done. Father, you know all these things, and yet you still love us. You love us, and you're willing and able to do something about our sin. You're willing and able to forgive us our sin on the basis of what Jesus Christ did on the cross of Calvary. Lord God, how we thank thee for this. How we thank thee that you, you love us so much that you are willing to send your son into this world, that he would be die on the cross, that he might be able to say to that man, that paralytic, your sins are forgiven you. To be able to say to us, your sins are forgiven you. This is a wonderful joy to know, to know peace with a holy and a righteous God. Lord God, we pray then this evening for everyone who hears this message, whether it be later or whether this be this evening, that they might know and understand that God loves them and that God is able to do something about their sin. I see these things, Father, in your son's precious name. Amen.